Hi, this is Stuart Weems and welcome to the Investopoly podcast. My goal is to give you simple, easy to understand strategies, insights and tips to help you master the game of building wealth. And in this episode, I'm going to talk about superannuation returns for the 2022-23 financial year to just finished at the end of June 23, of course. Uh, and as I do every year, I talk about you know how different industry funds have performed uh, and give you some insight into some of the things that I consider uh, when contemplating which fund I think might be the best. Uh, and then at the end of today's episode, I will give you a conclusion of which fund I do actually think is the best. Uh, so despite a pretty tumultuous year in share markets, and it's certainly a, a very rocky road, uh, returns for 2023 financial year were actually finished above average and mainly due to a very strong finish. So the last sort of three and a half months, um, for example, international markets rose by 12% over that period of time. So without that sort of rally towards the end of the financial year, uh, it probably wouldn't have been as good a year as it, as it was. So I've got a table, a link to the table in the show notes, of course, uh, but I've prepared two tables, one for the best balanced options and then one for the best growth option. Uh, and the growth options really defined are the option that gives you the greatest exposure to share markets. Uh, balanced options tend to have somewhere between 60 and 76% uh, of their allocation towards share markets. So I know that's a big range, but that's how they sort of define balanced. Uh, and essentially, Unisuper delivered the highest return last year, highest balanced return last year at 10.34%. Uh, and the uh, the worst of the top eight industry funds was Host Plus at 8%. So there's about a 2% differential between the highest return and lowest return of those top eight industry super funds. If we look at growth, uh, Australian Retirement Trust delivered uh, just shy of 15.3% uh, for their growth return. Uh, Aussie Super wasn't too far behind them, about 14%. Uh, and the worst high growth performer was Australian Super at 10.5%. So again, just for last financial year, the range is really 105 to 15.3% for uh, growth options. Now, if you have a look at uh, longer term returns, uh, Unisuper is the best over seven to 10 years for growth, uh, and Host Plus was the best over seven to 10 years for balanced. Um, uh, so, eight and a half to nine percent for balanced uh, over that longer term period, where 10 to 10 and a half percent for growth. So, of course, returns can jump around a little bit, and it's not possible or likely that. You know, the one industry fund will be at the top of the table for all those periods, you know, whether it's a short term one, two or three years or 10, uh, seven to 10 years and so forth. It will jump around a little bit. But of course, it makes sense to focus on longer term returns because you really want that sort of longer term performance. Um, and uh, certainly uh, Unisuper is uh, certainly up there uh, with them from an overall performance perspective, uh, and so is Australian Retirement Trust. So I wanted to spend a few minutes now talking about some of the concerns that I have with respect to industry super funds. So if we're investing or putting a lot of our uh, retirement savings uh, in a, a super fund, which most people are, of course, uh, then we want to make sure that that money is invested safely and wisely and, and prudentially. So I just want to take a couple of minutes to talk about some of the concerns that I have. And the, the first one is the valuation of unlisted assets, which has actually garnished a lot of attention over the last six months in the, the financial press. Um, and there's a, there's a lot of articles, in fact, that I've saved. Uh, so if you're interested, I can always share them with people, listeners. But uh, uh, And I have written about in the past uh, and also spoken on this podcast about how opaque the industry super fund investments are. In fact, there's very little reporting around them um, in terms of which investment managers they're hiring and firing, uh, what uh, unlisted assets they're, they're investing in, how they're managing those. You know, there's, it's, it's really a bit of a black box, if you like. Uh, and interestingly enough, uh, an independent statutory body called the Financial Regula Regulator Assessment Authority um, released a report into APRA, which regulates the industry super funds, uh, and said, and I quote, it's taken a reactive and immature approach to scrutinising super fund valuation processes, 
putting Australia's retirement savings at risk. Uh, and the regulator has heeded those warnings, uh, APRA that is, and, and told the industry super funds, hey guys, we're going to uh, pay closer attention to this. But really, I mean, they should have been all over it. And you know, there, there, there's certain um, obligations for a listed company. If you're a, um, a CBA or, you know, my or whatever it might be, if you're a listed company on the Australian ex- Stock Exchange, there's certain obligations, disclosure obligations that you have. You've got to tell the market about certain things and it creates a very efficient market because people can assess or, or, or at least to a greater extent ass- assess the risk associated with investing in a particular stock. Um, well, similar sort of disclosure obligations, I think, should be incumbent upon the industry super funds because we're putting our retirement savings in them. And whilst uh, the average Australian might not have enough uh, knowledge and experience uh, to, to look through or consider that information, certainly the financial press will, uh, and also certainly financial advisors will, uh, and it will make for a, you know, a much more robust industry. Uh, and so... Um, Unlisted assets and the valuation of unlisted assets has been, you know, one of the big things at the forefront in regards to this. And if we have a look at, you know, how industry super funds has val- have valued commercial office towers, for example, and I mentioned commercial office towers because there's been, uh, and I did a, a an episode in May talking about commercial property and, and its challenges, and the challenges it's had over the last year is, you know, interest rates have, are up uh, 4% in Australia, 5%. Uh, globally, sort of around the world. So, you know, cost of debt uh, associated with these sorts of ventures is, is, has increased. Uh, work from home has had a big impact on vacancy rates and even demand for space within commercial office towers. So just those two things, I mean, there's a lot moving around, but even just those two things suggest that, uh, you know, valuations are, are really under pressure. Anyway, so I tracked uh, what the press were saying about this and uh, I've got a list of, uh, you know, what or or how uh, certain industry funds responded to this. So Australian Retirement Trust uh, revised their valuations down by by 15%. This is just for commercial office towers. Australian Super down 10%. Aware Super down only 5%. uh, And CPAS down about 10%. So they're the ones that have been talked about uh, in the press um, and I said I've saved those those articles. So it's possible that you know individual assets will perform differently and hold up differently under different conditions. So it's possible that in fact uh, you know some funds have only revised their valuations down five percent and some by fifteen percent. That's a very wide range for a market that's been influenced by some of the same criteria or some of the same factors like interest rates and and vacancy. The point is that it's just impossible to assess uh, whether there's a lot of risk in those portfolios, whether the valuations are conservative or bullish, uh, and uh, you know w- whether it's uh, a, a good place to put your money. And that's the kind of the point that I think the regulator and uh, the oversight body has been making is that there needs to be more transparency and accountability here. Although I'm not that optimistic. Because last year, the Albanese government proposed two changes to industry super fund disclosure rules. The first one, it was seeking to remove the obligation of super funds to provide an itemised list on what they spend their marketing budget on and payments and including payments to unions. Um, And uh, now the industry funds don't need to give that itemised disclosure. They just need to tell, uh, give or disclose an aggregate amount to, to members uh, and apart from member education, you know, I fail to see how things like advertising on TV or sponsoring a union event helps boost retirement savings for existing members. Of course, it attracts new members and therefore cements, you know, the existing employees' jobs. But what does it do for the people that are already a member of that that fund? Because certainly there's been no scale. There's certainly been no economies of scale with the industry super funds. I mean, fees have been rising, not going down. Uh, with scale, so the, the the argument could be that they could make is well, the more the more members we have, you know, the the cheaper we can deliver our service. But that actually that's not true. Uh, any anyway, uh, I think if I was an investor in the industry super fund, and I'm not, uh, I would want to know where my money's going or what that fund is spending money on. And if they're going to just waste money on certain things, then I, I will take my retirement savings elsewhere. And I think. 
those disclosure obligations that the coalition government, I'm trying to be apolitical here, but you know, the, the coalition implemented those obligations and now the Albanese government has wound it back. Uh, the second change the Albanese government wants to make is they want to abolish the requirement for industry super funds to disclose political donations. And again, this is something the coalition uh, um, uh, legislated. Uh, the Electoral Commission data confirms that industry super funds have donated over $85 million uh, to political entities and associates over the last five years. So is that that's some of your retirement savings are, are going as being used for political donations. Uh, and as far as I could see, um, this change has actually received a lot of opposition from the Greens, the Coalition and the Independents. And I don't think it's been passed. I did a lot of searching around. It looks like that bill hasn't been passed yet. So, so at least that's good news. But as a multi-trillion dollar sector, you would think that disclosure obligations should be uh, increasing the amount of oversight uh, by both government and uh, just the industry as a whole should be increasing, not reducing. But it seems like the current ALP government is keener to reduce these um, uh, obligations rather than increase them, which I think muddies the water. And, you know, I'm not suggesting that there's problems within the industry super fund sector, but I know that we all know that problems thrive in the dark uh, and transparency and accountability are really the best antidotes to any potential problems. Uh, and so if everything is being managed well, then certainly the industry super funds uh, shouldn't have any problem disclosing that fact. So another observation I'd like to share is that perhaps high growth investment options uh, are better or more suitable for people that to invest in super. And there's two reasons for that. Firstly, the, if you have a high growth investment option, a greater proportion of your retirement savings will be invested in listed uh, stock markets uh, and less invested in these unlisted investments, which you know uh, no one really knows anything about. And so if I was investing my money, I'd feel uh, a lot more comfortable if it was invested in listed share markets because then it gives me a really good uh, sense of what the underlying performance uh, is and, um, and also the underlying risk. Uh, the second observation is that really in the long run, growth assets such as listed shares will generate higher returns than defensive assets like bonds and infrastructure and these sorts of other sub-asset classes. And so if you're a long-term investor, so that is if you're less than 50, which means that you know, you're 10 or more years away from being able to access your super, then it's very likely you'll be better off by uh, uh, investing more in growth sub-asset classes. Now, the traditional wisdom with financial planning is to have a really diversified asset allocation that gives you exposure to the many sub-asset classes to reduce your portfolio's volatility. And whilst it might actually do that, as in reduce your volatility, it also reduces returns. Therefore, if you can just make friends with higher level of volatility, that means that your super balance will rise and fall by substantial amounts, maybe from month to month, um, probably less so from year to year, and certainly n not very much from you know five-year periods to the next five-year period. But if you can make friends with some more volatility, uh, then it's likely you'll be much better off, 1% to 2% per annum better off, by investing a greater proportion of your balance in the share market. Now, there's two exceptions to this. Firstly, if you don't have the stomach or risk appetite for higher volatility, then don't do it. No point losing sleep at night over these things. And secondly, for some people, capital preservation is more important than, than investment returns. And so for those people that are closer to retirement or in retirement, uh, a more conservative asset allocation is probably more appropriate. But given how bonds have performed uh, terribly over the last couple of years and not done what they should have done, which is create some negative correlation with share markets, I'm starting to think more and more that uh, people will be better off just putting all their money in the share market and in some way ignoring other asset classes, You know, particularly if you're very young and you're going to be investing in super for the next, say, for example, 20 years, uh, you'd be much better off uh, to take that asset allocation. The next thing I want to talk about is that percentage-based fees are the enemy of anyone with high superannuation balances. So the economic challenge that industry super funds face is they have millions of individual members with very low balances. So as such, they need to charge 
fees on a percentage base basis because those members with low balances couldn't afford to pay higher fixed fees. And so consequently, members with higher balances end up subsidising those with lower balances because they're paying the line share of the investment costs. And that's just unfair, of course, if you're a member with a high balance. Uh, now, most industry funds have two types of fees. Uh, firstly, an admin fee and usually consists of you know maybe $1.50 or $2 a week, uh, plus maybe a, a small percentage fee. But admin fees are relatively low, somewhere between $200 and maybe $1,000 a year, something like that. The second fee is an investment fee, and that's almost always a percentage-based fee. And I've listed the, the fees uh, in a table on the blog and the website, which you can see, but really for balanced investment options, they range between 0.5% to 1%, uh, and for growth, they range between 06 to 0.9%, uh, for example. So on a percentage basis, can be quite significant, particularly if you have a, a high balance. You know, so for someone with 500000 invested in super, they're paying $4,000 a year in fees, uh, and you'll pay more each year as your balance grows, which doesn't always make a lot of sense. So by comparison, uh, our client portfolios, for example, that we manage uh, from a superannuation perspective, the weighted average cost is 0.3 of a percent. So a lot lower than these industry super funds, um, uh, sometimes a, a, a half to a third as much as these industry super funds. And they really do suit people with higher balances. So, for example, someone with a million dollars will save $5,000 a year just in fees alone, uh, and notwithstanding, um, I'm happy to say that those portfolios have performed uh, better than the average of those uh, industry fund returns as well. So, you know, fees are guaranteed, returns are not, and those people with large balances with industry super funds uh, might be better off considering going to an environment that offers them lower percentage-based fees because as their balance grows, uh, so will the dollar value of the fee paid. Okay, so let's sum it all up then. Overall, I think Unisuper is the best industry super fund, and I think that for three reasons primarily. Uh, firstly, the, the returns have been very strong, uh, if not at the top, uh, very close to it in terms of its peers. Secondly, invest the, the least amount in unlisted assets. Uh, so, for example, of its high growth option, 94% is invested in listed share markets, and that makes me feel pretty comfortable. And third and finally, it has the lowest percentage-based investment fees, which I think is, is really important, again, particularly for those people uh, with higher than average balances. Now, of course, this isn't personal advice. You shouldn't go out and switch a super to uni super just off the back of this uh, podcast episode. You should go and get your own personalised advice because there could be a lot of other important matters that I haven't considered or discussed in this blog, such as insurances and so forth. Okay, if you'd like to know more, uh, refer to the blog on the website. That link is in the show notes, of course. And until next week, bye for now.